I don't know how many of you remember Brother John Curzon. John Curzon used to be at Bethel. He was what we call in this modern day sort of a super genius. He was an inventor. And John was in Bethel for some 30 years inventing and designing and building machines. In fact, he even built a three-legged chair. Nobody in Bethel liked it, not even John. But he did it for an economy reasons. And uh, when we found it opportune moment, we moved all those chairs to the farm. And that's where they are. And I don't know what the farm's going to do with the meat here. <laughs> They're using them. But John was sort of a man in his own right. He was a rather marvelous person. Now, maybe you know Russell Curzon. Russell Curzon is he's loquacious. He, he doesn't end for words. And he knows everything about everything. And you'd be surprised, he's quite accurate, too. And uh, sort of a nice person to be around. John was more of the quiet sort. And one morning in 6.30, after John had been ill for some time, he came down in the lower dining room at Bethel, and he came up to me, and usually I get down there about 6.15, 6.30, and John and Russell both came down, and John says, Dan, uh, I'd like to tell you something. He says, for 30-odd years, I finally got my act together. He said, I got my head screwed on right. Well, that came as a surprise to me because John hardly ever talked that way. He says, I know where it all is now. For 30 years, he says, I've monkeyed with machines, nuts and bolts, and pleased no one, least of all myself. Well, he pleased a lot of people, but not in the way that John was talking about. He says, from now on, Dan, he says, I'm going to be a people's people. That's where it is, he says. Being with people. And he says, it's being with people, not machines, where it all is. You know, tragically, it wasn't even two weeks after that, John died. Here a man living, being wholly devoted to the truth, which he was, and uh, being immersed under machines, over machines, inside of machines. And then when he's in, when he finally finds out that the greatest happiness is to be with people, he died. And that, that, that's rather sad, I must say. And I say this so that we don't do the same thing. So we don't get so preoccupied with doing things that we forget there's something very beautiful around us. It's God's people. The little ones, the big ones, the old ones, the young ones. This is what Jehovah had made in his image and likeness. This is what brings praise to his name. And this is the intelligent reverberations of the great God, Jehovah, people who praise him. And to be close to people is perhaps the greatest joy that you'll ever get here on earth. And as people, we can't help but admire certain people. We admire them for their accomplishments, well, for their humility, for their personality, and for their humanity, whatever. When you learn to like people, and you're more apt to want to be forgiving too, you get closer to them. And we even admire people who live long. Whether they do anything or not, we admire them that the fact that they have lived long. Methuselah got his name in the Bible for having lived 969 years. We don't know a single thing that he did other than live 969 years. But uh, it's an accomplishment in this day and age, too. Would you believe recently a team of researchers went to the ends of the earth to find out why some people live longer than others, why some, uh, some people live to be 100 and over, and others give out 40, 50, or 60 years? And they came away with a number of uh, convictions, but primarily two. That there are basically two kinds of people, they said, that they have seen and talked to. One was the kind that yielded very quickly to any and every kind of pressures in life. They put forth little or no resistance. They quickly become overwhelmed by their surroundings, and they have a tendency to want to give up. That's one kind. We call them, in our vernacular, giver-uppers. They, they, they don't really hang in there. 
Just the other day, in the Bethel office, a young man came in there, and, and he says, Dan, I want a job change. And I said, what do you do now? He said, I'm a plumber. I said, well, being a plumber is a good job. He says, I know it's a good job, but I feel locked in. He says, I want to go. I want to move. He says, I don't feel I can move somewhere just by being a plumber. I said, well, what would you like to do? He says, well, I'd like to work in the office. I said, what office? I said, it's a big step from a plumber to the office. He said, well, any office. I said, you know how to type? Yes. I said, how many words a minute? He said, 40. Has he ever worked in the office before? No, he said, I haven't. Well, I said, well, I'll see what I can do for you. But here's a slip of paper uh, listing the names that are ahead of you who are asking for office jobs. And his eye went to the right, just like we read menus sometimes. We look at the prices first. Then we go back to find out what the food's all about, you see. And that's the way what he did. He, his arm went to the right, and he saw how fast these brothers typed. And he was amazed. He said, what? 80 words a minute? 90 words a minute? 100 words a minute? He said, I might as well give up, he said. Did you get the sound? I might as well give up. He came to the office to want a job change. And the first chance he gets to see... What he's up against, what does he do? He gives up. He doesn't have that stick to itiveness. He doesn't have that push, that fiber, that fiber that we must have inside of ourselves and say, despite the heights, the depth, the width, the length, I still want the job, I'll do my best to get it, and I'll beg Jehovah till I get it. No, this man is ready to give up. I had to beg him not to give up. Yeah. You remind me a little bit of a Elijah, Elijah was sick unto death, and uh, there was this King Jehoash, and uh, the Syrian armies were around him, and uh, Jehoash wanted the victory, and so he called Elisha like the great-grandfather, and he wanted his blessing. Elisha walked into this place, wherever they were, and uh, Jehoash says, I want a victory over Syria. And uh, Elisha says, in substance, how badly do you want this victory? And he says, well, I, I, I want a victory over Syria. It's okay, open up the window, shoot the arrows. He shot a couple of arrows out there. Good, you're, you're, it's a good start. You're doing something. Now, he handed him over a bunch of arrows, and he says, smite the earth with him. And this king, Jehoash, goes over there, and pop, pop twice. He hits the earth. Elijah jumps to his feet, and he says, my goodness, if you wanted the victory, he says, you should have beaten that earth five or six times to show what you feel like on the inside, to let God know what's inside of you, your sincerity, your desire to want what you're after. He said, this tapping the earth twice is not going to get you any place, you see, if you're going to fight an enemy. But this is the way it is with many people today. They don't want to put up much. They like it all on the platter for them handed to them. They want everything fast, immediate, instant coffee, instant tea, instant success. No sweat, no blood, no tears. They want to sit by the piano and they want to think, well, here comes Mozart, Beethoven, everything coming right out of the... No work, no rehearsals, no nothing, see? It just isn't that way. It doesn't happen that way. Now, these scientists said there's another kind of people. He says there, there's this tenacious kind, the kind that don't give up. And it is this spirit of theirs that causes them to overcome all kinds of obstacles. They've got something inside of them going for them. Frankly, throughout life, you, you can see these two kinds of people very easily, both in a physical or natural sense, and you can also see it in a spiritual sense as, as well. Recently, an NBC program zoomed in on the party given to a, an honor of a woman who was 100 years old. Maybe some of you have seen this. I think she was in South Carolina or North Carolina. Here she was, 100 years old, didn't wear glasses, had her own teeth. I envied her, you know. The fact is, she had more life, more spunk in her than a lot of 30-year-olds today. And she was 100 years old. And uh, I, I was amazed at that. The fact of the matter is, they had another old man down there, too, and the 
news team zoomed in on him. Here's this old man sitting there. And, of course, they, they're out there with their pads, and they, they think he's going to give them some inspirational super revelation of how he was able to live to 95 years old. And so when they put the camera on, on him, they said, uh, tell us, tell us, what's your secret? How come you live to 95 you, and you're so strong? And he says, he looked right straight into the eye of the camera. And he says, you really want to know how come I live this long? And all of them said, yes, 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 tell us. He says, just don't die. <laughs> That's, just don't die and you'll live. That's the answer. The old man did everything in the book, you know, but he was alive. He had no answer. There is none, really. There are things we can do. I think about some of these old people that they zoomed in on, and I said, big deal. You ought to come to Bethel. We've got some old-timers there, too. You take Freddie Franz, 88 years old. The other day, coming out of the 30 Columbia Heights building, I was behind him. And believe me, I was trying to catch up to that man, and I found it a problem. I thank God it was two blocks away before I caught up to him. And he has zip in him. I wonder where he gets his power. When he comes down into the room, he walks nine flights up to his room. Nine flights. Everybody, all the young ones, wait for the elevator. But Freddy is climbing up the ele uh, up those steps. One morning, it was that uh, I was coming down the stairs, and I hear this... He's singing. He can sing. He's a beautiful voice. And I said, my, it can't be. 6.30 in the morning, and I hear this tipsy tip coming down the stairs, and it's Freddy singing at the tip of his voice. And his opera, full of life. Said, My goodness, what, what, how does he get it? What's your secret, Freddy? Well, he let me in on a little bit anyway. But we have others there. You take Brother Genghis. Brother Genghis, if you know him, he's Greek. And he looks like he's always running, which of course he is. He's bent over. You think he's going to fall on his face, but never. That, that's the direction of the man. Going. I told someone here just today that I saw him jogging. He didn't put a coat on. He had to go to the mailbox to mail some letter. And the, that 88-year-old man was jogging to that mailbox and back, which was two blocks. Not bad for 88, I can tell you that. Not bad for 30. You see? <laughs> but we have other men like Peterson down there, up in the linotype department, in his 80s. This man, as far comes to linotypes, he knows their ins and outs. People all over New York call him up and say, would you come over to repair our linotype? I remember one time because I worked in composition and a whole bunch of us got around the linotype, there was something wrong with it. And we did this to this and that to that and everything else to it. And the one mechanic there, he was very, very good at it too. And he was embarrassed. He didn't want to call Pete. He didn't want to call Pete. He said, I ought to be able to solve this. But he couldn't. It was getting near 5 o'clock, and he wanted to solve the problem. So he called Pete over, and Pete looks at the machine, and he taps it a couple of times. This thing's all made of steel. I don't know why he taps it, but there, there he taps it. And he looked down, and he says, take this off. And he took it off. He says, now try. And the machine worked perfectly. <laughs> Here we, for a whole hour, banged our brains on the thing. He just lift up a piece like that, walked away with it. It's like this little knob down here. You, you don't push it or you swish it from side to side or something like that. But there are other brothers we have. We have there Warren Hibbert in his 90s. Would you believe a couple of days, well, maybe a year, year and a half ago, he went to Switzerland. Why? To climb a mountain. Nine years old, to climb a mountain. And I'm not exaggerating one bit. This man is something to behold. He still puts a full day's work in. Freddie puts a full day's work in. And Genghis puts a full in. Well, most of these guys put a whole lot more work in than just a full day. They, they work later than that. Then we have Shaka Sherry, Maxwell Friend, Sister DeCheka. These are jewels, marbles to behold. We don't have to go... And search the Ural Mountains of Russia 
for outer Mongolia to find these hardy specimens. We have them right here in our midst, and they're very, very beautiful brothers, lovely people to be with. Looked around here. We can see some like George Kelly. He's not so young anymore. He gets around too, you know. He fixes this place up. And uh, there are others too here. Brother Francis, one day in the room, and I thought, well, here's my opportunity, and I might as well zoom in on him, find out what his secret was. And I said, Brother Franz, what about this vitality that you have? How do you get it? And he said, well, Dan, if you want to live long, you're going to have to work at it. You have to work at staying alive. You can't eat everything or drink everything or go to bed when you want. He says, after you turn 64 years of age, you're going to have to watch what you eat, watch what you drink, and watch when you go to bed. You've got to work at staying alive. So it's just not some gift of being born with a strong constitution, which I think it helps. I believe those who were born before 1914 era have their roots, their feet, really bedded in a good earth before the wars, before the pollutions, before the hypertensions, before the drug era and everything else that we're plagued with. So I do believe they have a better constitution. But even at that, when you get to be 64, he says, you've got to be very deliberate. Make a deliberate effort at staying alive. Now, the reason I bring that up is because many of us don't put forth much of an effort of staying alive. We do pretty good when we're healthy, but when we get sick, then suddenly everything happens. We want all the nurses and all the doctors in. Then we watch our diet. Then it's too late. You watch these younger generations walking around here with a Coke in one hand, a bunch of bag of potato chips in another, and you work side by side with them and in the 15, 20, 30 minutes, they're tiring already and they look at you and they say, don't you want to rest? And they say, why do I get tired and you don't? And I say, well, you lay off those potato chips, maybe you'll last a little longer, you see. And it's a fact of the matter, much has to do with the way we eat. But think about these two kinds of people. One quickly yielding or crushed by whatever happens around him and the other indomitable. What makes them that way? We see at Bethel, and we see this at Bethel, young people coming in today. At first, they're all gung-ho. They're ready to tip the world upside down. They give you all the promises in the world that this is where they're going to live, this is where they're going to stay, and you can believe my word, but the truth of the matter is, within 60 to 90 days, you can already hear a difference in them. Something happens to them within that short period of time. They begin to complain about the food, job, the workload, the schedules. And you see these young people lining up for the chiropractor adjustments in the infirmary. My 20-year-olds lining up for an adjustment. I wonder why. They haven't lived long enough for their bones to come out of joint. So what are they doing down there? And the slightest sniffle. They don't even have the sniffle. They think they're going to have one. They're already asking for time off. But there are the other kind. Sniffles or no sniffles. Doctors or no doctors. They know whether you take the two pills or not, it's going to take you a week. Ten days to get over your cold, they go back to work. And these are the old timers. They're not afraid of that. They have that something inside of them. At the time where we get baptized, there's a scripture used in Matthew 16 24. We quote that scripture an awful lot. You remember what Jesus says there? If any man wants to come after me, if he starts with that little word, if. Why? Because he's not forcing us, he's not making us, he's not twisting our arm. I'll break your arm if you, if you don't. No, he says, if anyone wants to become a Christian, what does he say you must do? He says, let him disown himself. 
That's a very, very, very hard thing to do, to disown yourself. And yet every one of us, when we went down below the waters in baptism, did that very thing, disowned ourselves. But you see, be surprised how quickly we say, well, I think this is not the right thing, and I think this is not that, and I think this, and you find how little you have disowned yourself after a while. But Jesus says, let him disown himself the torture stake, which means the hardships, the sweat, blood, and tears that come with Christianity. The difficult as well as the good. And then he says, let him follow me continually. And if you do that... You'll be made. You'll you get this real strong Christian fiber inside of you, and you'll be made strong to carry on to do the will of God. The other kind, with aches and pains, well, they hang in there, these, these old-timers, and they're not afraid of that. But we see this also in the book of the Bible, in the book of Ruth, chapter 1. Isn't that a beautiful story there? Ruth and Naomi, there was Orpha, there they were in Moab so many years, and then they decided to go back. Naomi decides to go back to Israel, to her homeland, and here her daughters-in-law want to go back with her. And she says, please, don't come back with me. There's nothing out there that you want. She tries to discourage them. And uh, sure enough, for about ten days, I think, they walk, and then suddenly Orpha says, I'm going back. I'm quitting. What about Ruth, however? Ruth there, what does she say? What is there in verse 16 and 17? And Ruth proceeded to say, Do not plead with me to abandon you, to turn back from accompanying you. For where you go, I shall go. And where you spend the night, I shall spend the night. Don't you like that spirit already? My, your people will be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I shall die, and there is where I shall be buried. And may Jehovah do so to me and add to it, if anything but death should make a separation between me and you. Lovely. What a spirit. What a quality. Why, you can march with a person like that. And little wonder, I think it is in the second chapter, verse 12, where Boaz says, May Jehovah reward the way you act. And may there come to be a perfect wage for you from Jehovah, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to seek refuge. Yes, the way we act, the way we really trust Jehovah, the way we come to him with our whole soul, mind, heart, and will, this is where the reward will come. And may he reward you according to the way you act. And we see these two kinds of people with us. In a spiritual sense, for example, there was Judas Iscariot. For whatever reason, he betrayed the living Christ. He did it. But he gave up on life and hanged himself. He didn't throw himself at the mercies of God, on the mercies of God, but he simply gave up. He lost all. You take the Apostle Peter, denied the living Christ three times. He went away and wept bitterly over it. But he did not give up. When it was all over, he remained true and faithful as an apostle. He had that do not give up spirit. Don't lose heart spirit. He had the trust, that conviction, that determination not to. To give in, you find, because the flesh, that sinful flesh, wants us to stop, wants us to quit. And then there is, of course, the spirit of the world, Satan, the devil, and everybody else wants us to quit. But not Jehovah, not his people, not his organization. But if you get this spirit, this confidence working in you, it's a beautiful force to have. Jesus Christ, speaking about Simon Peter, said in the book of Luke, Chapter 22, verses 31 and 32. He says, Simon, 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 look, Satan has demanded to have you men to sift you as wheat, the nerve of the devil. Satan has demanded. Can you imagine 
demanded to sift people. That's the nerve of Satan. But what does Jesus say? But I have made supplication for you that your faith, your faith, not give out, but that you, once you have returned, strengthen your brothers. Sure, Jesus said you're going to have hard times and troubles. Paul said troubles are our lot. We're going to have these difficulties. We're living in a very hostile world, world that does not love God. It's going from bad to worse, and it's on its way out, thank God. But we are told by Jesus, and we're told by the apostles not to give up, not to lose heart, that God's word is true and is faithful, and it's sure we can depend upon it, and we must exercise the conviction in that word if we're going to stand up. Couple that natural potential with faith, that dynamic God-given strength, and you will survive whatever tests come against you. You will have gained the experience. You will certainly have something to talk about, something worthwhile to contribute, something that, with which you can strengthen your brothers. You find when brothers go to prison for the truth's sake. And when they come out, they can tell you of experiences that you don't know of. You take our brothers in concentration camps, our brothers who have been beaten, my goodness, to come face to face with them. They're filled with the strength and the spirit of Jehovah. And as Jesus said to Peter, when you have returned, strengthen your brothers. Go to them. Tell them what you went through. Tell them the sweat, the blood that you went, how you begged, how you prayed. And how you want it back in Jehovah's organization. And that'll help them. It'll help them to know what life and living is all about. The disciple James tells us that the endurance, that endurance has a work to do on us all. You look in the book of James chapter 1, verses 2 to 8, and then verse 12. These are some words hard to comprehend. I tell you this. Sometimes I sit there and I say to myself, to Jehovah, I said, Jehovah, I don't understand it. For example, right from the very beginning, he says, Consider it all joy, my brothers, when you meet with various trials. I don't know anyone that who is under a real vigorous trial that is really considering it all joy. You look at their faces, they're long. You can tell they're going through really up and down. But here he says, consider it all joy, my brothers, when you go to various trials. But reflecting what those trials may do to you if you stay in there, then you can realize, realizing why these trials have come upon you, then you can see the reason why James says all joy, because endurance has a work to do. Consider it all joy, my brothers, when you meet with various trials, knowing that you do as you do, that this tested quality of your faith works out endurance. Then he says, but let endurance have its work complete. That's our problem sometimes. We endure little, then we want to give up. But he says endurance has a job, and let it do its job to completion. He says, let it do its job to completion, that you may be sound and are complete and sound in all respects, not lacking in anything. So if you endure these trials that you undergo, it'll refine you, it'll refine your thinking, it'll improve your prayers to God, your relationship, even with your brothers. It'll make a better person out of you, and that's the Word of God. So if any one of you is lacking in wisdom, if you don't understand this, let him keep on asking God, for he gives generously to all and without reproaching it will be given him. But well, let him keeping, keep on asking in faith, not doubting at all. For he who doubts is like, as the wave of the sea, driven by the wind and blown about. In fact, let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from Jehovah, for he's an indecisive man, unsteady in all his ways. When we come to Jehovah, the God of the universe, the creator of heaven and earth, we must not doubt. If you want faith to function in your behalf, you must be strong, brothers, strong in the faith and the power of his might. 
You must believe. Now you look at the verse 12 there. Happy is the man that keeps on enduring trial. Because on becoming approved, he will receive the crown of life which Jehovah promised to give those who continue loving him. So that's where it is. The reason why we bring this point up is because so many people give up too quickly. They can't endure hardship. They can't endure the winters, the heat, the jobs. They don't like their overseers, the house to house work, the territory. There are a million and one different things that they don't like. They quickly give in. But we need this real fiber in us to be able to take what is not even that we like, endure in there, and make of us a better person for having done so. They say there must be a better way, but is there? Giving up is not a better way. Endurance is God's way. And if we do things God's way, there can be no better way. The Apostle Paul takes up this same theme in his letter to the Hebrews, chapter 10, verse 32. Look at the way that Paul expresses it. This whole book of Hebrews is on faith. And here in chapter 10, verse 32, he says, Keep on remembering the four former days in which after you were enlightened, you endured, endured a great contest under sufferings. Sometimes while you were being exposed as in a the theater, both to reproaches and tribulations, and sometimes while you became sharers with those who were having such an experience. But you both express sympathy for those plundering of your belongings, knowing you yourselves have a better and abiding possession. Something to think about, brothers. Because we might lose our belongings, but we've got to fix our heart on the living God, realizing there are better things than just the things that we wear or the food we eat. There's a life out there to be had, and it's everlasting life. And believe me, if there's anything worthwhile, it is that. Jesus said, what profit will be to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his life? What will it profit him? Nothing. So get a hold. Get a hold of that life, brothers, and don't let it go. Paul, in fact, says to Timothy, lay a good foundation for the future that you may gain the life which is life indeed. He didn't say build a house for the future. Because there's no time. In this short life that we have, the best we can do is lay a spiritual foundation, the type of foundation that we can stand all these trials and tests that come upon us. Then Paul goes on there in the book of Hebrews. He says, but you have need, need of endurance, in order that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the fulfillment of the promise. For yet a little while, and he who is coming will arrive, and will not delay, but my righteous one will live by reason of faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. And isn't it beautiful now the way Paul expresses himself? Now we are not the sort that shrink back to destruction, but the sort that have faith to the preserving alive of the soul. That's the kind we're made of. We have faith. We have this belief, this determination to move on and with understanding of doing the will of God. So, this call to endurance on the part of God's Word is an area all of us can work on in everyday life. Learn to put up with one another in love. Learn to endure. Learn to appreciate the hour in which we're living. And this John says in the third chapter of the book of John, or Revelation rather, he says this is the hour of test to come upon the old inhabited earth. So know the hour that you're in. But we have another help to help us to stand firm in this day and age. The Apostle Paul, speaking of this, refers to it in the second chapter of the book of Corinthians, or second Corinthians, the fourth chapter, verse 1. Notice there the way Paul says this. That is why since we have this, this 
ministry. According to the mercy that was shown us, we do not give up. So this awareness of a ministry entrusted to us will help us to stick, to stand, to remain firm. God has given this great privilege to us, and if we appreciate it, this too ought to move us to remain firm in the faith. Now what ministry is this? This is the ministry of the good news about the Christ. Now what are we talking about? It's the glorious good news about Christ being raised from the dead, being the first fruits, Christ ruling his king and his kingdom. It is about everlasting life in the paradise earth and is to understand that he is the way, the truth, and the light, and that no one comes to the Father but by him. When you begin to understand and appreciate that Jesus Christ and all that he has done for us, and when you begin to sense that we are to follow in his footsteps closely, then you begin to really appreciate what Paul expresses in Romans 15, 12. This is something we all should read, underscore, line, and make a part of our own believing. Paul there quotes from the book of Isaiah, and he says, There will be a root of Jesse, and there will be one rising to rule nations, and on him nations will rest their hope. And of course, he's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. Then Paul says this, May the God who gives hope, may the God who gives hope, Fill you with all joy and peace. How? How, brothers? By your believing that you may abound in hope with the power of Holy Spirit. By your believing, brothers. And this is where we find the weakness stands. You cannot build fiber inside of yourself. You cannot stand unless you believe the Word of God because the Word of God is powerful. It's able to make you stand unto salvation. This is Jehovah's way, but you've got to believe. You cannot come with doubt in your heart. It is by your believing that the word preached about the Christ becomes a source of strength to us. You can read these words, and they will mean little or nothing to us unless we mingle them with faith. Then first, we'll get excited. We'll have the faith. And we'll gain the strength that leads to salvation. But it's by your believing, not simply sitting out there and listening. Mingle this with conviction. And when you mix that with conviction, you'll be surprised what goes through that bones, the bones of yours, the strength you get. You wonder why some people can stand. It's because of this. They do believe. A young brother came to the personnel office in New York. And he says, what's wrong with me? I've been raised in the truth, he said. My great-grandmother's in the truth. My mother's in the truth. My brother here, he says, is in Bethel with me. We're a twin. He gets all excited about the truth. He says, the truth does nothing to me. What's wrong with me? I don't feel anything, he says. What's happening to me? The truth of the matter is, something very, very seriously has happened to the man. Someday you'll read in the book of John, where Jesus was moving out. He was in the city of Capernaum. He spent all day there and he made many miracles, the Bible says. How many? Seven, eight, nine, we don't know, but the Bible uses the word many miracles then. Coming out at evening time, he leaves Capernaum and he's walking out, and the scribes and the Pharisees are with him. And guess what question they ask him? What do you think they said to him? Master, what marvelous miracles, none of the sort. They said, Master, would you show us a sign that we might believe? All day he was out there, and they were with him, and they asked him for a sign that we might believe. What was wrong? What were they asking for? They were begging him to do something supernatural to them physically, 
to force him to believe, make them to believe that he was the Messiah, the Christ. To go contrary to free moral agency, and Jesus said, no, nothing of the kind will be shown you, but we will give you a sign, the sign of Jonah. As Jonah was in the bowels of the fish three days and three nights, so the son of man will be. Now, what sort of answer is that? The truth of the matter, Jesus was simply telling them, if these miracles and all of this work and everything that you have heard cannot motivate you into conviction, that you cannot bring your inner bowels to say, come on, what's wrong with you? This is something to put faith in. If that cannot do it, then you're going to hear that one of these days I'm going to be put to death you're going to know I've died, and then you're going to hear that I've been raised from the dead. And if hearing that I've been raised from the dead does not move you to conviction, then nothing will, you see. And sure enough, these Pharisees found it a very, very difficult time to believe that Jesus was Christ the Messiah. This ministry is a treasure. It's not only a privilege that we possess in these earthen vessels. You take it in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7. Paul elaborates, We have this treasure in earthen vessels. Why? There's a power beyond what is normal. Beyond what is normal. Maybe God's and not that of ourselves. We're coming to a point where we ex exert ourselves, we exhaust ourselves, and more is demanded than the power beyond what is normal comes into us. Then we know, we know that Jehovah has come to our aid, has given us the strength and the courage to be able to stand and to do the work that he has asked us to do. We are pressed in every way, but not absolutely with no way out. We are thrown down, but not destroyed. Always we endure everywhere in our body the death duty treatment given to the Christ, that the life of Jesus may also be made manifest in our body. Verse 16, 2 Corinthians 4, 16. Therefore, we do not give up. You get the point. You have this ministry. You have the Spirit of God. You know His will. Don't give up. Why don't we give up? Because we have fastened our sight on the living God on the reward to come on things unseen, on things everlasting. That's why. Now, is that true? Sure, it's true. But the big question is, is it true with us individually? Is it true with us individually? Brother Martin Pitzinger, who's on the body there at Bethel, spent nine years in a concentration camp in Germany, and talking to him one day, he talked to me. He's an amazing thing. Here he is. I think he's 78 or 79 years old. And he, he's he got a vitality, a strength. He looks like he goose steps instead of walks. He just moves with such strength. It's an amazing thing. So I, I talked about it. I talked to him about these things. I say the man looks immortal in the flesh. Doesn't look like he's going to die. But if he wants to go where he's going to, to he's going to die in these days. I said, what is it that made you stand in the concentration camp? And he said, Dan, he says, you've got to have a reason to live. He says, we, we, he says, we, we have a reason to live. We are Jehovah's vindication. Jehovah's given us a word. Jehovah put us here in the concentration camp as a field service. We cannot die, he said. We got to live. I said, my goodness, I could see without him even telling, just to see him talk that way. He had a ministry. He had a mission to fulfill. He must never say die. He had a purpose to live. Our purpose in life. And he tells us, he says, Dan, how important is this? Father with two sons doesn't know Jehovah doesn't know the sanctification of Jehovah's name, doesn't know the kingdom. The father of the two sons sees every day 120 people killed or die in, 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 in these prisons. 
And soon, he says, the morbidity comes on you and you lose the will to live. And one day, he says, the father grabs the hands of his two sons and deliberately they walk to the electric fence and together they grab the fence and three of them are electrocuted. Why? Because they have no will to live. They have no hope. They don't know the living God, Jehovah. They don't know his purpose. They do not believe. Brothers, we're coming into very, very, very serious time in human history. If we do believe the Bible, this earth one of these days is going to be a devastation because Babylon the Great, everything is going to be annihilated. What do you think about that? It's going to be rather frightening. And we're going to have to have a sound faith. We're going to have to... Earth has been devastated. And then what the will of God is, so we can keep on living. They say when Jerusalem fell in 607 B.C., he that uh, those who survived Jerusalem under Gedaliah, when they saw the devastation, it so disappointed them, so emptied them that they ran to Egypt. They were afraid of the devastation. You can rest assured it's not pleasant to look upon corpses. But there are other things, too. You look at these determined type of people, and you ask yourself, what is it that gives them the strength? Why can't I have it? My, I need it. And we do need it. All of us do. Did you remember reading in the Watchtower, February 15, 1981 issue, there was this woman, the Catholic woman, that went to church. She was very devout. She prayed all the images. But she didn't trust the priest. The priest didn't behave themselves very well. And she said that her prayers were not answered. She was very, very disappointed with the church, so she left. But it was hard. Food was hard to come by. I believe this was in Czechoslovakia or in Poland. I'm not, I'm not sure where the experience took place because the watch star doesn't say. But she said she went looking through the streets for food. And she saw a sign that says, Bakery, Bacardinia. And she went and knocked on the door. And a woman came to the door and she says, do you have any bread for sale? And the woman says, oh, this bakery was closed a long time ago. We just forgot to take the sign down. And she looked at the woman and she realized that the woman was hungry. So she said, come on in. She says, I'll give you something to eat. The woman went in and on the table, there was a Bible. And the Catholic woman says, is this a Bible? And she says, yes. Oh, she says, you don't know how I want to serve God. And the woman in this house is one of Jehovah's Witnesses. And she starts a study with this Catholic woman. The woman with her three children come into the truth. They're all baptized. The only problem is she has a husband that doesn't love God. He chases her with a cleaver, wants to kill her. By the grace of God, she escapes. And then he tells her, he says, it's either the home... Or Jehovah, but not home and Jehovah. She chose Jehovah. She took her children with her. What did she do? What would you do with three children? This is what amazes me. This woman went out and she said she read Hebrews 13, 5. With my whole heart I have trusted Jehovah and his assuring words. What were those words? I will by no means leave you or by any means forsake you. This woman says, I believe those words so much that I went into full-time work as a pioneer. And she joined the full-time work. She and her children went into the full-time work. They grew up. Twenty-two years later, she sends the children back to her father to see if they could locate the father. They did. He stopped his drinking. And they witnessed to him and he comes into the truth. And on April 4, 1971, he is baptized. Today, the sister is a happy grandmother with four grandsons, two granddaughters. She has her husband with her. Amazing. What conclusion can we reach? The woman never gave up. She trusted to Jehovah, the living God. She had the faith and the strength to carry on. And God did not forsake her.